Yeah. Okay, that's cool. And uh, uh, good morning or good night to everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to just uh, introduce uh, the two speakers today. And our key speakers is the Dr. Uh, Jiayu Zhou. And Jiayu is the current uh, associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineer at the Michigan State University. He, re he received his PhD degree in computer science from Arizona State University in 2014. And uh, Dr. Joe has a broad interest in large-scale machine learning, data mining, by medical informatics, with a focus uh, on transfer and uh, multi-task learning. His research has been funded by ANZF, NIH, and Office of the Level Research, and published more than 100 peer-reviewed journal and conference papers in data mining and machine learning. And uh, Dr. Joe is a recipient of NSF Career Award in 2018. His paper received the Best paper, uh, Student Paper Award in 2014 IEEE International Conference on uh, Data Mining and the Best Student Paper Award at the 2016 ISBI and the Best Paper Award in 2016 IEEE International Big Data. Our second uh, discussant is the Dr. Fei Wang. Um, Fei Wang is an associate professor in the Division of the Health Informatics Department of Population Health Science, uh, well, uh, Cornell the, um, uh, Medicine, Cornell University. He got his PhD from the Tsinghua University in 2008. He's a recipient of a national exceptional Excellent doctoral uh, thesis award. Dr. Wang's current major interest is AI for health data science. He published uh, close to 300 papers on top uh, journals uh, and also the conferences uh, such as ICM, KDD, and many other journals. His paper has received a uh, lot of citations so far. And uh, he his, and uh, his papers has won eight best paper watch in the top conferences on data mining and the medical informatics. And uh, I think now is your turn, Jiayu. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zhu, for the very detailed introduction of, you know, both of me and Dr. Dr. Wang. Um, yeah, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure to uh, give the presentation today uh, about my research on the neurodegenerative diseases. Right, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I have a um, very detailed, um, uh, bio just presented by Dr. Zhu, so I'll just give that. So first, I'm, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about what we do uh, in our lab. So uh, I'm from Aileden Lab from Michigan State. So what we do is we're, all of the research we have done, been doing are surrounded by this Y equals FX, right? Um, so we give an input, we're trying to model this function and give an output. It can be, uh, it can be classification where we're trying to classify uh, into different categories and it could be a a regression problem we're trying to predict like the the stock price and you know things like that and it could also be the reinforcement learning uh where we give the stats x is our states and uh, we're trying to predict the action uh we're trying to do right so uh all of things are surrounded by building this tiny little fx um, and what we do is, you know, typically we have a, uh, we collect a bunch of train data and we have this learning procedure and we're trying to model this F and trying to infer this F. Uh, and in a lot of domains that we've been working on, we also have this domain knowledge, right? So if, uh, if we're working on this bioinformatics and uh, especially in, in some kind of domain where you have a lot of knowledge that not in the form of your training data uh, and it could be help it could be very helpful if we can design specific learning algorithms and models that can integrate this kind of knowledge and we're trying to learn better f right uh, and then we focus on different aspects of f so we, uh, so we start with the performance or what we call generalization performance of that uh, which means you know we're trying to build an f in a training data and then we're trying to uh, have this F to perform as good as uh, as possible in the data we haven't seen before, uh, the, te the testing data, you know. Uh, and, you know, so usually there are kind of some kind of like uh, distributional differences between your training and testing. So uh, in the generalization, you probably have to consider about this and consider uh, all kinds of bias, so for example, and then you 
um, trying to build this kind of um, learning algorithm that can be robust against this. Uh, and the second direction we have is more recently we consider about other aspects other than uh, the performance itself, right? So we consider the privacy, we consider the robustness and fairness. Uh, all of the are, are secondary, I'll say secondary properties that are other than predicted performance we consider. Uh, and I'll also consider about this interpretability of the model where uh, really we build a model. We're trying to explain to people what we uh, what we got in our FX and why is building this is making this prediction, right? So this is, uh, I think it's the important part for human to trust this AI systems, why you're making this prediction and what makes you make it prediction, right? Um, so yeah, so for the generalization, we basically what we do is we, uh, as we just mentioned, we're trying to integrate a different type of knowledge, right? So uh, for example, uh, we do this transfer and multitask learning typically in a scenario where we have multiple learning uh, either domains or, or or learning tasks, right? So by learning tasks, we mean uh, one classification task is a, uh, is a task, right? And then we have multiple related uh, this classification or regression problems, and we're trying to uh, simply borrow information from other learning tasks to help us. Uh, so that's knowledge from learning. And then also sometimes we have this data knowledge, right? So if we have multiple types of data and some of the data may not be directly used and so, um, uh, so we can, you know, trying to do some kind of knowledge fusion, uh, data fusion uh, from different sources or modalities, trying to bring this information together to make a prediction. Uh, and then also we have this from the domain domain knowledge where uh, we're trying to revise our objective function or, uh, you know, trying to formulate in different ways so we can, uh, during the learning process, those knowledge can really be guiding us uh, to, let's say, a region where, you know, the solution are better in terms of the quality. Um, uh, and also we, we do a lot of like missing data, noisy data and trying to be robust against those. Um, and then second direction, the robustness, as you, you know, some of you may um, be very familiar with, right? So if we're dealing with this kind of deep neural network, especially, uh, let's say, for example, we have a, we have a, a tall example here where, um, you know, you see those are, um, you know, a, a decision surface, decision hyperplane uh, of a neural network. So we have this kind of positive region and have negative region, and then all those training data points are sitting over here. And then, uh, you know, if you take a look at this, decision boundary, right? So you find out that um, some of the data points are sitting really near the decision boundary. Right? And then if you search through this decision boundary, there are chances that you can uh, find one of the spots, right? And then if it's, uh, let's say if it's medical imaging, for example, right? And so if you find a spot, meaning that you actually find a, a imaging we use for training, and then it could be a, a very uh, risky stuff, you know? So you actually have people stealing uh, training data from you, um, from your training, uh, from your model. So there are uh, things, trying to prevent when you're trying to build the model and trying to release the model. And so people won't steal training data from you, right? And then, um, yeah, and then we can actually use this kind of uh, 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 property to protect, you know, to, to discover something in our data as well, right? So typically when this happens, means some kind of overfitting and some kind of, um, you know, some kind of smoothing you can do uh, for your model as well. Um, and also, yeah, interpretability. And we, we're trying to, we're trying to, uh, bring as much information as possible for, um, you know, the predict information for people to uh, know that what's making this prediction and what's inside our data. Uh, and, when, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we also built this human in the loop type of learning systems where we really trying to have this expert be involved in the uh, learning process to provide this guidance along the way when you do the, the actual learning. Um, so yeah, that's the three direction we have, and we have applied this in uh, quite a bit of applications. I would say uh, one of the major thing we do is we're trying to use them for uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and we have our, also applied our um, our machine learning algorithms we develop in, in a lot of different areas. We uh, say, for example, medical informatics, and uh, more recently we have this kind of uh, molecular studies and so trying to uh, we're trying to discover uh, you know drug signatures and then. Uh, provide some kind of uh, treatment as well. Uh, and we used to work on a lot of the uh, traffic informatics as well and uh, liminology. So today I'm going to uh, mainly focus on this neurodegenerative diseases, right? So for some of you who don't know about that, uh, I don't know if you have seen this movie before, it was Steel Alice. It's, uh, uh, it's an Oscar movie and back in 2014. Um, you know, I've been, I've been in, 
I've been working on Alzheimer's for last, I'll say, 10 years, right? So that, that means, you know, even uh, it's more than more than 10 years. Yeah, so that means that when I was still a PhD, I'm, I'm working on this Alzheimer's, right? So by, by then, my advisor got a, uh, got a grant on the Alzheimer's and I worked on it. And you may be curious why, what makes me to, um, you know, work for so long, right? So in fact, 2014, I was, um, I graduated and I was, um, uh, I was working in the Bay Area and as a, um, and as a research engineer where I do a lot of like recommender system, trying to do this, compress this kind of deep neural network, trying to do this recommender system in mobile devices. I do a lot of fancy stuff, right, back then. Uh, and then people would say, hey, why are you doing this kind of Alzheimer's? Kind of boring, right? Uh, but the thing is that uh, really, you know, this movie is part of the thing that actually changed my, uh, I would say, career girl, right? So you see that, you know, people are suffering from different types of duties, and really there's something that you can do. Uh, you know, your expertise can actually contribute on that. Um, yeah, so, so you know, about, you know, 2014, this movie actually uh, moves me a lot, and then uh, saying why why not just go back to academia and then you know before I had a chance and before I still you know when I still had a chance and you know I'll just go back to academia and then continue working on this um, thing and I find a lot of more exciting problems to 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 work on it so today I'm going to show share with you some of them um, yeah so so what is also you know so when we talk about neurodegenerative diseases uh, typically refer to a couple of Disease, or one of them being dementia, right? Uh, and then today we're going to focus on dementia, right? So one major type of dementia is called Alzheimer's, and then it comes with a lot of symptoms. We have typically pretty know uh, well-known symptoms, right? Including memory loss, communication and language issues, and you know lack of capability to focus uh, and pay attention, and you know reasoning and judgment. And in the end, you know people will lose this vision as well. Um, so it's a uh, it's a, you know, seems pretty, seems pretty okay, I would say, as compared to cancer and stuff. But uh, let me tell you why. It's, uh, it's, it's much worse than cancer. And the thing is that it lasts longer. And then, uh, you know, at the end of age of that, it'll bring huge pain uh, to the patient and the people who surround the patients, right? Uh, so the care is pretty costly. And then, um, you know, you cannot take care of yourself. And uh, that's, that's pretty, pretty bad. And then what makes it worse is that, um, we don't actually have that many ways to stop it, slow it, or prevent this disease, right? There are a lot of failed clinical trials. We know that a lot of good news and then turn out to be not that effective uh, later on, right? So um, yeah, so there's been a lot of efforts, right? And then, um, and still we need more efforts to actually um, help on this. And then um, for those of you who don't know this, uh, you know, this in our brain, we have this connecting neurons, right? Uh, and then one of uh, hypothetical uh, pathology of this Alzheimer's is that we have those kind of plaques and uh, forming in the brain. And then that is cutting down the connection between your neurons. And then your neuron is, you know, lack of nutrition is kind of that, and they become part of the plaque and then it's going to continue killing more and more brain uh, cells, right? So that's uh, that's why um, that's one of the hypothetical. There, there are a couple of hypotheses behind it, uh, and then it's actually the sixth leading cause of death in the United States uh, by 2000, uh, 2021. And before that, it was five. And you know that who is be <laughs> get jumping like uh, before this, right? Uh, and then you know the, the 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 main issue of Alzheimer's is you know people are going to live through this years of morbidity, and this is really a pain. Um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, national, this is uh, internationally, uh, we'll see like uh, around 100 million people are going to be affected by this by the end of 20, 2050, right? So that's going to be a, a lot of them, a lot of people. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a direction that NIH has put a lot of efforts. Uh, and then, you know, we're fortunate to uh, actually join the forwards to, to tackle this kind of disease. And then we're going to talk about, today we're going to talk about a couple, uh, actually two research we have done on this direction. Uh, one of them is from Imaging Markers. This part is also more uh, a supervised learning problem. Um, so it's, it's not like the reinforcement learning part. The reinforcement learning comes later when we talk about behavior and especially language markers of that, okay? Uh, and then, uh, so yeah, so why do we use imaging, right? So if you take a look at this kind of Alzheimer's disease progression, um, you know, we start with what we call a mild cognitive impairment where we have um, 
some part of the brain is just is starting to go bad. And then in this time, you, you will have this, this kind of short-term memory loss, right? Uh, and, and then people will say, hey, I can't forget, I, can, I kind of forget, um, you know, things about, you know, pretty recently, right? Including what I have done in, in, in the morning, let's say, for example. Uh, for those of you in the evening, right? So I can't forget what I have done in the morning. Uh, and then getting, if it's getting severe, you kind of forget like which floor I am, you know, this kind of um, memory, but this short-term, pretty short-term memory. Long-term memory is fine. You can still recognize your um, your family members. You can still, um, you can still recognize your, your friends and you can you can know that a long time ago what's what's in your childhood. Uh, and then other um, a couple of years after that, you know, some people are turning into what we call the mild Alzheimer's, you know, clock is ticking and then uh, two years and you get moderate and then get severe and finally that. Right. So this pro this is what we call a progression. And then you, you see that different parts of the brain become uh, bad on, on, along the way. And then uh, we all have different symptoms along the way as well. Uh, and then if you take a look at the brain, right? So this is brain autopsy, you know, like the illustration of that. Uh, you'll find that the brain really changed a lot, right? And then uh, you'll find that, you know, the normal brain is, is pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty rich, I would say. Uh, and then if you take a look at the right and you'll find out, you know, the Alzheimer's brain is uh, it's pretty, you know, smaller in, in terms of volume. And then you have a lot of more like, um, ventricles or you know empty space inside of your brain as well so you know it's easy pretty i'll say it's pretty easy for somebody to tell you know it's an alzheimer brain and a healthy brain right uh and then that's why people are starting to work with this kind of uh imaging markers we're trying to use different type of imaging uh to study how this disease progressed over time right and then we uh we used to uh, oh you know so we started with the pet imaging and then uh more um you know we'll have a lot of established research on um, how to using this kind of uh, T1 and or T3 kind of MRI imaging. And then more recently we use uh, uh, this uh, DTI, you know, it's a diffusion, uh, diffusion uh, imaging MRI, and then trying to, you know, trying to model, trying to see how those connections bring your brain, uh, inside your brain are changing over time. Um, yeah, and then it comes when it comes to imaging, you know, people will say, hey, this is this is pretty good, right? Because you know, nowadays we have a lot of uh, very fancy, I would say very fancy ways to dealing with image, right? With the image, let's say, for example, we have to, uh, now we can do a lot of uh, tracking, right? So especially for those of you in China, uh, you probably know that it's pretty powerful to actually track individual people, uh, you know, just recognize them and trying to recognize different components. And, and uh, some of you, I believe, is working on this autonomous vehicle. So you, we know that uh, we can recognize a whole bunch of things uh, just using the camera, like, like the Tesla type of vehicle. Uh, uh, and then what's building behind this is, you know, nowadays, you know, we usually back in, I said back in 19, uh, 1950s, we have already have this perceptron, right? So we have um, uh, this kind of uh, neural network, you know, starting to grow by then. And nowadays we you know deep learning has been everywhere. People have been building this kind of fancy networks using huge amount of data, right? So what's, uh, and then, you know, we can do so much thing about it. You know, every every morning I, I open up my browser and you, you see like huge amount of new research going on in the archive, right? So it's it's just it's just fantastic. And what's behind this, um, I would say, uh, scenario people getting into this domain is perhaps because we have a lot of data, right? So uh, we have, you know, uh, five, five years ago, we have this imaging net, maybe more than, maybe earlier than that, right? So maybe almost five, 10 years ago, we have this imaging net, right? Uh, now we actually build this fancy library and then we have, uh, yeah, we have around 14, how many, 14 million images, right? And then we can use them to, you know, to uh, actually put into our deep neural network and we're trying to build really fancy neural networks out of that. And then we need a lot of training data. Uh, but what, when we're talking about Alzheimer's, it's kind of a different scenario, right? Think about that. If we're trying to build a model, uh, trying to build a regression model, for example, to predict the disease in the future, right? So what we do is we have this different type of imaging and we have some kind of clinical samples of, you know, the blood samples and, uh, you know, we've got a proteomics and, you know, different type of uh, proteins inside of, uh, uh, you know, in, inside the blood. And, uh, you know, we have everything ready uh, for one patient, that's fine. But how many patients do we have to build this kind of model? Uh, and then I'll show you like a one example, right? So all, uh, Alzheimer disease, uh, neuroimaging initiative, ADNI, it's a very famous project, right? It has two phases, 
three, three phases. Uh, but the first phase, right? So I would say, for example, we spend like five years and then we have uh, uh, six million dollars being spent on, on, on this project, right? And then uh, how many, guess how many samples we have? We have barely 819 samples out of the uh, quality control and everything like that. We only have like, um, 120 samples, right? So we have to recruit samples. We have to build everything around this patients and trying to, you know, set up a reasonable cohort. And then we have to follow this uh, patient for let's say five years and then getting high quality imaging. That's really that's really um, a lot of efforts, right? And then um, and then especially when you have this in multiple institutions, right? So in the end, uh, after all those things, efforts you have. I mean, eight twenty. 19 samples, right? And that's all we have. And then you don't have this kind of 14 million uh, samples, right? And, and, and for you to actually learn this kind of classifiers on, you know, disease, non-disease, how, and you know, if they're gonna uh, translate to another stage, you don't have it. So that's uh, one of the, and one of the things, but what can we do, Can you know, because a lot of machine learning uh, algorithms are motivated from this human experience. And can we get some insight from human learning as well, right? Uh, so I can, you know, my, my th now it's my three-year-old now become four, five year old. My five year old actually, you know, see it's learning from, um, you know, when, when she was three year old, she can actually pick up uh, new concepts from just a few examples. You don't have to feed the child with 14 million images for, for her to, to learn anything new, right? So uh, you don't have to feel like even thousands of the imaging to tell that, hey, this is a tree, this is a lion. Uh, it's not the case. You just show her, show him like a, a couple of images and take, take, take her to the zoo and, and she will immediately you know, know that it's a, it's a lion. Um, and and what, we can, what we can learn from the human learning is that uh, a lot of things we learn are not independent, right? So they are actually coupled with each other. Um, so we have a lot of learning tasks and then one build on each other. And then they actually, um, you know, they can, you know, when you learn something new, it's, it's actually the process of you uh, trying to form that concept and trying to tie into those uh, concepts you have already learned in the past, right? And then uh, sometimes you learn a couple of things in, together and then they're actually uh, starting to help each other. So that's why we, in, in machine learning, we, we develop a lot of learning paradigms where we have the transfer learning, we have, uh, um, you know, we have a source domain, rhetoric domain, I are trying to adapt to that and we also have this multitask where we're trying to learn a lot of things together and you know we have more fancy stuff uh moving forward right uh and a couple of years ago and that's like a, a five years ago um you know andrew Ain actually in europe's conference we're talking about the trend in the industry as well um you know supervised learning has been very successful and widely applied and you know the next trending topic is uh the transfer learning as you see nowadays you know you you, you see this kind of zero shot learning and few shot learning and you know especially in the nlp right so a lot of a lot of people are actually working on that so um yeah so transfer learning is, is has been a very um a uh, large domain and then in clinical side and uh, in clinical application, especially if you don't have enough examples, this could be something that can help be helpful as well. Uh, you know, Dr. Wan and I, uh, we've been working on this medical, um, medical informatics for a while where we applied a huge amount of, you know, uh, you know, just develop this transfer learning, multitask learning on this and pretty, pretty successful. I'll give you an example of um, how we do that in the cognitive um, predicting cognitive scores. So we have this kind of uh, one score Y we're trying to predict, you know, which is characterizing how good it is uh, in terms of the cognitive status, right? Are you able to do certain kind of functions or uh, we're trying to have a, like a score to characterize really uh, how good a patient is doing, right? So in, in the healthy, how healthy the brain is. And then you know, our input features are the Im imaging, right? Imaging features, right? So we extracted, a, um, you know, the cortical surface, extracted some variables from your uh, medical imaging as well. And then uh, we're trying to put up in the vector and then we're trying to predict this Y, okay? So that's uh, X and Y. And then we're trying to, um, you know, the, the thing we do is we're trying to um, have this prediction function. And, you know, here we use a little bit different uh, linear model because 
you know, um, the reason for that is pretty simple. So we don't have enough data to build a deep model in the very beginning, in the very beginning. Uh, and then we start with a linear model, right? And then uh, because the score we're trying to predict there, they have the lower bounded, right? You can't predict like less than zero. So uh, we have applied this real function as well uh, in, in, in outside of this prediction function, right? So this prediction function looks like this. And once you have that, uh, according to the textbook, what we can do is we can build a likelihood function, uh, and then we can, you know, optimize the parameters um, by, you know, minimize that uh, loss function, right? So that's what we do. Uh, and then uh, if we're trying to bring information from other learning tests, right? So let's say, for example, we have a, um, the same the same inputs where we can, you know, we have a learning test to build different cognitive scores. Um, and predicting each type uh, cognitive score will be a one prediction task, right? And then we have uh, different X and Y, for example, we have a set of four X and Y. And then uh, what we can do is we can try to uh, build a model that can predict them simultaneously, right? So the, um, the rationale behind it is that you know all of the scores they are kind of similar to each other uh not similar but you know they, they're kind of related to each other uh where they are characterizing different aspects of your brain and then you know the prediction are not totally independent right in, in, in fact it's if you look into um you know if you if you actually look into the the way they measure those scores you know some of the cognitive functions are overlapping with each other so there are you know we have enough reason to believe that they're not independent uh, and then, so we can build a model to predict them simultaneously, right, for X. Um, yeah, so uh, if we can build all this four, let's say four or five uh, uh, prediction tasks together, potentially they can leverage the information from each other during the learning process, right? So, so what we can do is, you know, what we what we what we have to, down is that uh, we're trying to create this kind of subspace, right? So, so when we're talking sub subspace. Uh, you see that, uh, you know, if we have like uh, each learning task. Uh, and the model is W, right? So you put all this W together, you know, form a matrix. Um, and then this matrix, if you assume there's a, a subspace, basically you assume there's a, uh, yeah, so you basically assume it's a low rank matrix and you have some kind of columns and, uh, you know, shared this kind of coordinates. And then, you know, the tasks are located in those um, set of coordinates, right? So uh, to visualize this process is that if you learn this task together, right here, uh, one node is one learning task, the model of one learning task, right? So we visualize not just the, not the data, but the, the model, right? Each model is a point. And then when you're trying to learn them together, they're kind of creating this kind of a subspace, uh, which we will see this yellow plane here. And then during the learning, they will just uh, try to, you know, the subspace is trying to drag uh, all the all the tasks, trying to bias in a way that trying to drag all the tasks to that subspace. Okay, so it's not dragging the data points, it's dragging actually the model itself. It's trying to bias the model, right? So, you know, so you see this subspace is actually learned from um, the set of tasks, right? So it's, you know, it's like a distilled knowledge from the, 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 the all the tasks, and then we're trying to bring them together. Okay, uh, and then it's trying to bias, you know, so it's in a way. And then this happens in every single iteration. Um, so you have this kind of multitasking. So that's what's, uh, what's behind it. Okay, so uh, with this kind of thing, what we can do is, you know, we're assuming there's a subspace and we're assuming there's a low rank uh, structure inside of that. And then we uh, basically, you know, we, we just basically explicit put this W decomposition uh, into U and V in, into that, uh, into our model, right? And then we have this new uh, loss function and then this new, new loss function, it will be uh, solved by, you know, either coordinate descent or uh, sometimes, um, you know, we do more fancy than that. Okay, and then the, the, the one other issue here is that, you know, to, you know, computationally, if you solve this U and solve this V, and then it's going to be computationally expensive. But, you know, of course, nowadays, when people are talking about a couple of days of training experiences, this is no, not considered as uh, uh, expensive that much, but uh, still, if you're try trying to build different models and trying to uh, explore different hyperparameters, you know, it's trying to make your algorithm as efficient as possible, right? And then uh, you don't want to use this block coordinate descent every time because, you know, each time you're solving like a block of variables and you do this over and over. Um, so we actually have a, this you know, some, some kind of fancy stuff where we just have to go through one pass of your training data and then you can 
uh, you can still get a very good high quality subspace and we can prove that's the case. Okay, but that's not the, uh, yeah, that's not the focus of the talk today. But uh, one other thing we have to mention about it is that uh, since we're using linear model, even though we put a real function there, uh, it's still considered to be quite linear, right? And then, um, you know, if you have this kind of feature feature interaction, it cannot actually be captured in those linear models. And then there's something we'll want to do more about it, right? So we're thinking about, can we do like, what's a deep multitask learning? Uh, but this ad, this term actually have a paradox. The reason, because uh, if we're trying to do multitask learning, right? So typically when we say uh, multitask learning, it's, you know, one of the motivation, one of the key motivation is that the sample size is limited. Yeah, just like the sparse learning, right? So, you know, people really hear like a sparse learning nowadays in this general imaging domain because they have a lot of data, right? So if you have less terabytes of data and you're trying to build, use this kind of uh, uh, complexity control type of uh, method, you have to be, uh, have, you gotta have a very good reason for doing that. Uh, but in general, you don't, right? So, you, you know, it has, you know, you don't have like a large sample size and you're trying to use multitask learning. Uh, and then the other thing side of that is we're trying to use deep learning, right? But deep learning really says that we have to, um, uh, we, we need to, have a lot of data before we can explore this kind of nonlinear uh, interactions among the features, right? So uh, combining this two actually is not that easy, right? So intuitively it's not easy, uh, but the good thing is that we can actually, um, we find a way where we're trying to view this now it's layer by layer and in each layer we're trying to do the same thing as uh, this one layer we're trying to uh trying to sketching the subspace and we're trying to uh, you know we're trying to do the same trick on the low rank space you know in each layer of that uh each layer of this network and then you know once a layer is trained it's never looking back so you don't have to do this kind of end-to-end -to -end training potentially expose yourself to uh, a huge search space and then this can actually give you a pretty good performance model and then which can come with kind of nonlinear, uh, you know, can capture some of nonlinear information inside your data. And then um, you can, we can still pretty good. And, and then that's, that's some what we call subspace land work. And then so that's the work we have done a couple, a couple years ago where, but we're still using that today because it's, it's quite, it's quite, it's, it's very fast, right? As I was saying, it's, it's more like a, each time you train one layer and it's done, it's fixed and you, you just do this. And, and of course, we can, you know, in the end, we can do the end-to-end -end fine tuning if we have enough data. But if you don't, you don't have to do that. Um, and then we validated, you know, the conversions and subspace recovery is pretty good. And then, uh, especially if we apply that into our uh, problem itself, and we find out, you know, the in terms of predicting cognitive score, it can give you a um, better performance than deep neural network, and also the simple uh, multitask learning, and even, you know, of course, the sim single task learning as well. Uh, and more than that, uh, because we're building this network layer by layer, it comes with some kind of intuitive explanation of uh, what are the things that are activated this layer, right? So uh, if, and then, you know, so each layer, you know, what kind of brain region are actually um, activating, and then the trying to passing the information to next layer and how they're this interaction or are, are doing, you know, we can we can actually easily to visualize that. All right. So this is the first work we've done where we're trying to deal with the sparsity when trying to do this kind of nonlinear feature interactions using this multitask learning model. Um, uh, you know, if you if you really come into the place where you want to use some kind of multitask model, we, we, we do have a package where we offer, uh, on, you know, fairly online where you can explore all kinds of, you know, more than, I would say more than 20 different methods, right, you can quickly try that. Uh, okay, so that's, that's, an, that's and then we even we even put a human in the loop for that to learn this kind of task relationship, or we're gonna, um, yeah, we're not gonna talk about that today. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll save the questions for later. So we have another session about. Um, so, yeah, so we're gonna continue talking about, uh, you know, I'll say the meat of this talk. <laughs> Sorry, Tim spent so, so much time. Uh, but uh, I was told I have one hour, right? So I um, still have a, like a, half of the time. Uh, yeah, so we, we um, that's says front imaging, right? And then uh, nowadays we're doing more research on the digital markers, right? So when we're talking about digital markers, what is the motivation of that? Um, you know, typically when people find some severe memory issues and you know if you if you go to the clinic it's, it's actually too late right so we want to collect uh, more patients that's early phase and then we're trying to discover the disease as early as possible but unfortunately right so if you uh you know finally 
brain symptoms, right, to getting really bad is uh, typically in the middle of the MCI, the later stage of MCI. So we want to have more people to know that something is going on uh, very easily, very cost effectively, uh, perhaps not go to the, any uh, primary care physicians, you know, just to very easily to screen yourself um, against this dementia. Uh, and how can we do that, right? So we find out, um, yeah, so the, the, the research question is that we have to do this kind of early detection and that is affordable and accessible, right? And then uh, this means that we don't want people just to, to visit your physical, uh, to visit a specialist before they can get assessed for that. Uh, and then we turn into different type of uh, data sources. We turn into behavior markers where we're trying to, we have this kind of test bed where we set up those all kinds of different sensors uh, in, in the patient's home where, um, yeah, so we, we, we trying to collect the, the behavior, the working speed, and you know how much time you, you have the social time, you have this internet time, uh, and it's your sleeping quality. And then we find out there's, um, you know, we find there are pretty much a, a good amount of signals there. And then the signals is not overlapping with the brain signals as well. Uh, so we're talking about that in different talk if you're interested, but more we're talking about language markers, right? Um, so this this is all about this language markers is, um, you know, a couple of years ago when I was walking with my uh, kid in the, in the play playground, uh, and then we met this very old lady where um, we're trying to engage your conversation, right? So I say, hi, and, you know, how are you doing? And then, you know, start, you know, things should start to flow, but, uh, you know, some exception happens, you know, this old lady was talking about, um, you know, her home is not far away, and suddenly, then, you know, it's like a talking about something else. So each individual sentence you hear is, is pretty, you know, pretty much what's going on. But if you put the entire conversation together, that's pretty awful. You know, you don't even know what's what's going on. Right? It's like a, um, every sentence is uh, more like this disconnected from each other. It's pretty bad. So I was talking about uh, to my collaborators in the, uh, in the OHSU where uh, she was conducting this kind of uh, language study with Odin senior um, senior people, and then, uh, you know, uh, me and uh, Dr. Wan and, uh, you know, Dr. Hiroko Dot were coming together saying, hey, can we maybe spend some time here in the conversation, and then we, can we see that if we can get some signal out of that. So we do, we do, you know, since we have this kind of clinical trial going on, so we're having this kind of uh, data uh, moving forward, and, you know, we have this conversation data, and then we find out, that, you know, simple ways we can, we can simply, you know, uh, just count some kind of keywords inside of the conversation, and then uh, we, we actually can, you know, use very simple, let's say, I think we, we use support vector machine, and then uh, we build this machine learning algorithm, and, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good, right, so we have this kind of 72.5 kind of AUC uh, on the patients, which is fantastic for this kind of MCI uh, identification right? you, using imaging you can you can do no much better than that uh, and then so we start to think about what's going on here uh, right so when people are talking about that you know so the algorithm underlying thing is like if you think about the, your all the words and your syntactic structures they're forming some kind of distribution right and we're saying that you know when you're talking about things you know this distribution is starting to grow and then um, you know if you talking infinite amount of thing and you know in an infinite amount of time and then this distribution will be a pretty stable distribution over there uh, and then uh, well, what's make this algorithm to be successful is that you know this I would say algorithm this this study to be successful is that there are significant differences between the distribution uh, um, of two type of you know be, between this normal uh, cognitive no, normal subjects and the MCI subjects right so um, they have this so you know the, the way they speak actually different so uh, that's a, that's a good sign so which means that if we talk to people enough uh, you know. Um, let's say for a long period of time, and then we can use what's inside the language to, um, to find out if this patient will have some early risk in, in uh, Alzheimer's, right? Uh, but the thing is that, you know, this clinical trial is pretty uh, time expensive, uh, time, you know, pretty costly. Uh, we typically need to engage the, the, the subject for two or two, three sessions. And each session we have 100 turns of conversation, right? Uh, so we ask questions and then they answer that and, you know, have to a lot of turns. And then you connect, you collect enough kind of distribution uh, information about the distribution where you can, you can build, start to build the differentiation model. Um, and then uh, we're thinking about, can we actually, 
you know, do much better. Can we do better than that? Can we do, uh, let's say, can we maybe just ask a few key questions, you know, based on your answer, we can ask a few key questions uh, and then trying to find out the most, uh, uh, the places that characterize these differences most within as short amount of time as possible, right? Can we do that? Can we sketch this distribution, right? Can we just um, not, we don't need a, like a accurate distribution for doing this. We can, we can just ask a few questions, right? If, you know, if I ask you one question and then you're, you're just talking, talking about, uh, you know, your daily life. And then if I find out, maybe if I know more about how you talk about politics, um, to ask us, uh, what did you do yesterday? We're trying to recall some kind of memory, right? And then, uh, you know, based on the response, and we're trying to, uh, you know, we know some the distribution there is pretty clear, and we want to know some something here. And then, it's, you know, based on our training, we know that maybe we should ask this question instead. Um, so we're trying to ask a couple of questions, and then, you know, we, we kind of have this kind of very kind of uh, good distribution approximated. Um, and then, you know, the technical details is that, you know, the user simulator is basically, um, you know, we have the question encodings in, in, in this work. So we uh, basically use fixed amount of uh, questions uh, as 104 and 110, I can't remember, but we have this kind of questions as an action. And then uh, the simulator will, will be um, will be built in a way where the output of the simulator will be the uh, skeptic embeddings of that. Uh, so you know this, this you know this is a simulator, right? So outside simulator, we have this um, we have this MCI classifiers where we're trying to um, we're trying to predict, right? Trying to predict based on the existing conversation, what is confidence of our classifier, and then you know with all this kind of states, so what we're trying to do the reinforcement learning agent is trying to engage with the dialogue uh, manager, trying to ask new questions, right? So uh, and then you know trying to improve the um, classifier confidence, right? So one of the goals, and we're trying to ask question in a way that I can boost the confidence of my classifier as much as possible. Um, so that's, yeah, that's how we do. And then we find out, you know, by using this, uh, this model is we actually, can, uh, it's, yeah, we, we trying to, yeah, so it's resume, but yeah, so um, we find out that with with just a couple of questions, we can do pretty much pretty good distribution as compared to you know the full conversation, fully engaged conversation. And then um, yeah, so that's work we published last year. Um, and then we find out you know within uh, with this kind of method, right? So we are able to identify this um, this MCI with even higher performance, right? So. Recall the the number we had it was seventy three, uh, and then now we have this eighty one point eight. So it's it's kind of amazing. I mean, it's, I would say it's a lot of information in the language. And then recall that the distribution is, um, it's pretty. You know, it's it's pretty. I would say, uh, it's pretty early stage, and there are a lot of improvements we can do. Um, and then you know. By doing this, we can do more efficient because we don't have to conduct like a long conversation with a patient. And then we can, you know, on the other hand, we only spectrally have higher performance, right? Uh, and then uh, if you if you kind of think about what's going on, so we used to have this kind of supervised learning where we, we use a simple model to collect the uh, distribution. And then we reformulate that into a reinforcement learning. And then this reinforcement learning actually is, uh, you know, it's a it's a reformulation of the supervised learning where uh, it's trying to you know um, dig into the conversation and trying to look into some key information and then discard some of the information. Uh, for those of you who come in from supervised learning, as 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 my background, you realize that this is perhaps trying to do some kind of uh, cleaning information cleaning, or you can say you know you can say in in broader case, it's doing some kind of um, some kind of um, uh, I'll, I'll say feature selection type of thing, right? So you're trying to uh, do, you know, so yeah, I, I was aware that more recently people are using reinforcement learning in a lot of interesting different learning to do some kind of feature selection and things like that. I will say they, they may have the very similar spirit underlying. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about, 
uh, I'll spend one minute, one, two minutes on the future work, right? Um, so we recently get the 4 million grant by collaborating with, you know, our collaboration actually lead to this um, uh, R01. So we can we can continue working on this in the next five years, where we're trying to uh, work on more uh, high efficiency language markers. Now we only use this very simple like uh, embeddings and we may have to customize the embedding and customize the language model a bit for this. And then, um, and also we're trying to build an app on that. So, you know, the, you know, privacy issues and, and the robustness issue could be an issue, right? So, because we're training the model in a very, in, in the lab experiment. Um, so we have very good device and, you know, very clear conversation. But in the end, if you want to deploy that to somebody who's holding a phone, maybe it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, the environment is pretty awful by then, right? So you have to, a hard way to actually uh, run your algorithm on that kind of scenario, right? And then, um, and then, moreover, we're trying to generate these new questions instead of sticking to those 100 questions we have before. So it's more like a chit kind of goal oriented chit chat. Uh, and then, yeah, so we're trying to bring you know because we have in in addition to uh, the the language, we also have this video captured. So you know the facial expressions. Right? Sometimes when I ask you about your let's say your uh, short-term memory, you're trying to invoke your short-term memory. And if you had a problem doing that, your face will show something. Uh, we're trying to extract that kind of thing as well. You know, you're trying to use more and more information inside the language to do that, you know, more robust multimodality learning. Uh, and then, yeah, so uh, as I just said, this robustness is a kind of issue when you're trying to deploy your model. And, you know, if you're trying to do this online learning uh, and then uh, you kind of, you know, you, you, it's, <laughs> Um, you kind of have this problem when you're trying to deploy an app. For right? some people, will use very good phone, and sometimes people won't you use very good phone uh, or device. And then you know, if you're trying to train something, it's going to be um, um, not. You know, some of them can use robustness uh, kind of augmented algorithms. You know, using the adversarial training and uh, advanced smoothing, but some of them won't be able to have a resource to do that. Uh, but can we? Kind of share, you know, kind of transfer this kind of robustness, not just performance, but robustness to other people. So that's something we're working on as well. Um, yeah. So uh, and the other thing is that we, we kind of uh, funded this kind of uh, uh, nonprofit organization where we're trying to offer this technology to, um, you know, the seniors. Uh, you know, at, at the moment we're trying to do that in, in the United States. We're trying to, um, um, sorry, we're trying to we're trying to build this. Um, mechanism where we recruit those subjects and we're trying to uh, give them, you know, the app and then give them the, you know, some of the conversation. So to help them, um, yeah. So trying to push this technology all the way to the uh, subjects. Um, yeah, so um, so that's a brief yeah, introduction of our um, work recently. So, you know, we'll work on this kind of conversion AI, um, you know, our lab and then, um, yeah, so, Thank, I would like to thank our collaborators and you know my students. You know, the brilliant students are the ones who are actually getting most hard work down here. Um, so thank you so much. And then now um, I'll say question time, or you know, Faye is going to ask me some questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Jerry, for the for the uh, nice presentation and uh, for for the folks on the uh, online. So I have been collaborating with Jerry in the past almost 10 years. And uh, of course, uh, Alzheimer's disease is one of the core collaboration, uh, collaboration topic uh, we, are, uh, we have been working on, but also on other um, machine learning topics. So, uh, but uh, I think this is, uh, um, uh, I mean, the first time, I mean, I, I, I do this discussion, I play this discussion role in, in a talk, I assume it is like a moderator and a panel. So I'm, I'm going to throw out some questions I prepared. And uh, uh, so uh, Jiayu and I, perhaps we're gonna discuss, but uh, for others, uh, feel free to, uh, to chime in um, if uh, you have uh, comments or other questions. Um, so I, I think, I think uh, uh, first, uh, 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 since this is a, a reinforcement learning uh, seminar series, and uh, Javi presented uh, our work on using uh, reinforcement learning uh, for, uh, I mean, kind of like to build a chatbot to realize the, um, our goal is to do early uh, MCI uh, detection from uh, uh, hopefully uh, the, the dialogues 
Uh, and uh, I think I think one thing is, Jiayu, as you showed in that lens neurology paper, like the progression, the different progression phase uh, from the brain change to the cognition uh, decline for Alzheimer's disease and uh, uh, typically, I mean, the, the, the one of the limitation for the clinical approaches is well, when we identify them, it's already in a late stage. That's why we want to explore those other markers, to hopefully to identify them early. Uh, I mean, like uh, this, this uh, uh, dialogue and, and conversation is uh, uh, definitely something really interesting. But uh, uh, like, uh, like you presented, like uh, our assumption is that uh, when... Um, uh, when, uh, I mean, because we want to identify this early, so when there is some abnormalities when people talk, like they're different, talk differently than normal people, uh, typically how early is that? Uh, in other words, uh, I mean, this uh, language marker, do they appear in a relatively early stage or, I mean, comparing to those like imaging or protein markers? Oh, so that's a, that's a pretty good question. You, you basically saying, uh, I think for now, you know, this current study where we're trying to do is we're trying to, uh, you know, focus on this phase, right? So cognitive normal and uh, MCI, right? So it's like early phase of MCI and cognitive normal. So that's uh, basically the, the, the study. And then what comes with this is that if you, I mean, if you look like this um, curve, so of course, those are hypothetical models, right? So this kind of brain structure change way before uh, any any kind of symptom appears, right? And then, so it's, by symptoms, that basically means this memory, uh, short-term memory, especially. Uh, so, you know, that kind of changes in the brain happen, you know, they must come with some kind of changes in, you know, the behavior. So I, I guess that's, that's what we can do. And then we can push, you know, you know, with this technology, what we can do is we can collect the early face as much as possible. And if we can, if we can get some kind of uh, subjects, on this phase, and we can really, uh, you know, identify the let's say identify the disease like a couple of years before it's onset. Uh, by onset, I mean going to going to the MCI. Then we can we can have a lot of good things uh, to do about the disease, and you know, by developing new drugs and uh, therapy uh, for this, right? But yeah, so uh, to answer your question. Um, how already, and I, I think we are currently focusing on on this tight little region here, you know, trying to find the boundary here. Uh, but we can do more than that with this technology, where uh, we can we can do we can push all the way to the place where you know the brain start to to change, right? Even before anything happens, anything right, happens. right. Yeah, no, I mean, that's uh, that's uh, uh, very interesting. And and uh, I think that uh, leads to my second second uh, question. I think a lot of the people may also have is uh, like, uh, because we are focusing on uh, like uh, people, I mean, uh, 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 for patient progressing to AD at a specific stage. Uh, so uh, although we, uh, you know, do clinical trials to collect the dialogue sample or conversation samples, but I assume, like you said in your first part, um, the sample size, uh, I don't know, it might be a challenge, like, uh, you know, uh, for reinforcement learning as well. I mean, I mean in, in our uh, case, it is even more challenging because you can imagine, like, Jaya, you talk and I talk, we talk in different ways, right? That's so right, that's right. There are a lot of, in, uh, you know, individual variabilities. So, I mean, our model now, I mean, performs on Hiroko's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, data, it performs pretty well, but uh, 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 how much do you think, uh, like, uh, uh, it needs to do, or how long uh, it needs, I mean, uh, for uh, going to really uh, practical Okay, yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, you're basically, you know, if, uh, yes, the, we do talk differently, right? So people do talk differently. Um, and that's why um, I think nowadays people are using a lot of ways to like normalize the conversation um, by using, you know, public data. Uh, say, for example, you know, the MRI itself, it's, 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 um, it's one example, right? So you have different imaging uh, from different people, but different people may have different, um, you know, shape of the brain or things like that. And you have to normalize that into some kind of template before you can start to even analyzing them. Um, so, yeah, so we can, you know, by using some 
spirit, we can build this kind of references or template by uh, public data, right? So we can, you know, outside of the Alzheimer's, we, we, we have a lot of public conversation data available anywhere, uh, everywhere. Uh, and we can use them to build some kind of standard template and trying to eliminate some kind of personal uh, variation by building this template. And, uh, but, you know, we can use a template to strip off some kind of personal information as well. On the other hand, uh, technology-wise, what we can do as well is, um, you know, if we try to build an app, let's say, for, for example, to, uh, to patients, we can basically have this kind of personalized model as well. Uh, you know, if the user use them for a while, using them for a while, we can actually normalize this personalized uh, variability as well, right? So that may be wait till we deploy the system and we have this kind of personalized model uh, on top of that. Yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting. I I, I think that's uh, also uh, uh, talks to a technical challenge about reinforcement learning in general, right? So how can you uh, consider this individual variability when uh, during your uh, you know uh, learning process? And and yeah. also I think yeah, and also I think you pointed out the eye contact uh, uh, initiative you you co-founded with Hiroko. I think that's a really really good and important initiative to engage. Uh, uh, patients and, and also through the process, I mean, um, but you can like uh, build a better model. I think that's a, that's a really great move on this. Uh, and, and I think um, another thing maybe uh, uh, aside from Alzheimer's disease, but, but more from reinforcement learning, I mean, for myself, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I do a lot of uh, research on another type of data, which is electronic health records. Uh, and uh, people in medicine uh, nowadays, uh, they have a general interest in reinforcement learning, of course, for obvious uh, reasons since First, Google yeah. wins, yeah, since, uh, Google wins uh, you know, the gold game. Um, and uh, there are some you know, top-notch papers like MIT and Harvard, they, they published a paper on nature medicine where they are trying to use reinforcement learning to learn a treatment adjustment regime for patient in ICU uh, suffer from sepsis, uh, where they use reinforcement learning to adjust the dosage of intravenous fluid uh, and vasopressor uh, during the time. That, so essentially, because those two drugs, I mean, come with a combination, you need to adjust the dosage based on your observation about the patient status. I mean, of course, the status captured by a bunch of uh, uh, lab tests, right? Uh, so, I mean, but, but uh, I mean, there are other similar stuff in the clinics, uh, like, for example, there's another uh, work from MIT where they try to use reinforcement learning to adjust the, the, the still the dosage of any anesthesiology drug. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, and also I, I remember I also saw like uh, some, some people from Stanford, they use uh, still RL to adjust the dosage of some drug to treat VTE. I mean, but my concern, I mean, I, I think the, the, the my concern for those kind of application is, uh, you know, like, for example, for uh, adjustment drug dosage in treatment in critical care, uh, it's a, it's a life threatening scenario. So, uh, you know, like a uh, 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 misadjustment or, uh, you know, some, some mistakes can cause very severe outcome. And plus one of the uh, technical challenge for uh, those techniques uh, is, uh, you know, for EHRs, I mean, electronic health records, uh, you may not have enough uh, data to do all the counterfactual inference to basically uh, accurately uh, get your estimation about the award. And, and, and essentially there are lots of spaces in your uh, action spaces, I mean, the decision passes, you, you really don't have the data to support your inference. So if there is a like a mistake on your uh, guessing or estimation, it can lead to a really, really, you know, um, uh, 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 severe outcome. So that's why I like our, our scenario, like in this conversation uh, a space where our goal was, uh, uh, I mean, of course, to have a low, low cost uh, solution to, uh, for uh, early detection of MCI. And it is serving as a screening tool. So essentially, if we say, uh, I mean, this person is having a problem, I mean, of course, further checkups is needed. Uh, so I don't know, uh, Jiayu or any 
any other guys in the in the um, uh, Zoom. Uh, so I mean, if you have any thought about uh, like uh, the appropriate uh, or promising uh, application scenarios of uh, uh, reinforcement learning in uh, medicine in general. Yeah, I can I can I can comment uh, on this a, a few questions before uh, the audience can you know, of course the audience can jump in, uh, but the thing is that do we really expect you know let's say for your your case and you know you you're trying to use it um, you know we have the states that's uh, uh, like um, help you know status inside of the body and then trying to adjust the dosage and things like that are we what we're trying to do here are we trying to uh, simulate you know what human experts are doing or we're trying to explore a better way you know trying to use the like dosage in a in a unique way that can maybe even outperform the performance of human right so that's that's maybe one of the questions i have uh, it, you know for um many of the reinforcement learning problem we're trying to you know we have this kind of exploration we have to explore new strategies that uh, hasn't been funded before right so you know you honor to beat people in and 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 go game and all the kind of thing you have to do better than human right and then you have to better than you know, existing rules, but in medical, do we really have to do that, or um, we just try to simulate, you know, human experts doing, you know, top of the uh, top of the notch, like doctors, they're doing this way, so you know, I'm doing this way. Uh, so that's that's you know, that's one of the like philosophical questions, and you know, what we what is the goal of this uh, applying this reinforcement learning, and then uh, of course, you know, that in from the historic data, what we can do is we can find all kinds of correlation, and then. Uh, it's hard to, you know, without intervention, it's hard to do like a causal analysis and things like that. But using the data, we can all we can do is, you know, something like this. We can we can build simulation. We can build very good simulation uh, environments, and you know, the reinforcement learning can actually learn, you know, how um, humans are doing, or even even you know, slightly better than that is possible. But uh, I won't say it can do, you know, like uh, develop like a unique treatment to like uh, uh, the way of using vent you know, ventilation and combination of that dosage and to to have something stabilized. It's kind of hard to do that. I mean, without this kind of uh, uh, um, you know clinical trial, it's it's kind of hard to do that. Uh, but with the simulation, you can do as uh, at least as best and uh, as human experts are doing. And then uh, you know, if you deploy some system in the production, it's more like a uh, you know trustworthy type of AI type of thing where you you really want you know your reinforcement learning policy don't deviate from uh, some safe region, right? So let's say uh, the reinforcement learning trying to say, hey, I'm, I'm trying to use like double the dosage, right? But never, you know, you never seen people do that before, you know, and then, then you, you can't, you can't let the machine to decide to do that. So um, yeah, so that's, that's my, you know, five cents on, on this topic. I don't know. It's like maybe home two can actually comment on this. Yeah, and in general, yeah, I think there's a, for reinforcement learning, if you really wanted to use the in medical science, this is, I think the one thing is, is, is going to, okay, it's happening, but I think it takes uh, much longer, uh, it's, it takes time. And it also depends on the, the subject areas. And there are some fields, some of the specific problems, you know, and think of that's a direct, it's not a direct related to like a treatment. Maybe uh, maybe faster, and for other things, yeah. this really depends on which stage you want to to do. You want to do do prevention or doing diagnosis or or like uh, treatment or prognosis. And I think that's the different. Basically, for these four different categories, maybe reinforced learning may may play different roles, uh, insight, and also this depends on the. How do you connect the data? I think the given the, the current development of te technologies, in particular, all kinds of the sensors and also these apps that people deployed. And I think the, the, for these different questions, I think the I do think reinforcement learning may play critical roles in insight. And uh, and uh, um, but I think all this is another set of questions. I think the, the reason I'm got interested in reinforcing one thing is because for the tech companies, they have a tons of data you can easily uh, kinds of in kinds of updated policies so that you can uh, easily get a lot of kinds of feedback. And for for the for the medical sciences, and we need to really find the the, the which directions so we can really, use this 
to get some you know, good result. I think that's, I believe so, because you think about that reinforced learning is kinds of our uh, uh, kind uh, up kinds of update and upgrade our kinds of policies and in you know, a kind of more efficient, effective way. Even in the old days, we're doing medical sciences, we still tried to improve our policy all the times, right? And uh, there's, but it's at a different kinds of, even though uh, from the concept of the perspective, people didn't mention that, that reinforced learning, but actually they're doing that one and the kinds of, you know, implicitly. And so I think I do, I do see a value of the reinforcement in the medical science. And just not just about the clinical trials and doing experiment designs, although what Jayu did is, and I think there's a lot of more applications that should be done. And I think that's the future for us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hongtu and Jiayu. I think those are really, really good points. And uh, I think what, what Hongtu said is uh, naturally brings to my next question. I think uh, data is the most important, right? So like Jiayu, you also mentioned like federated learning, uh, how can you, you know, uh, uh, jointly learn from uh, multiple different data sources in a privacy preserving way is one of your future direction. Uh, you know, and federated learning, these kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, privacy aware learning strategies is getting more and more popular in, in medicine recently as well. There's a paper on nature medicine, there is a paper on nature cover. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, I, I guess uh, like uh, this uh, availability of data is also like, uh, I think, uh, like uh, funding agencies like NIH is also aware of that, like their recent initiative, like Aim Ahead, and also, uh, you know, Bridge to AI, they emphasize, uh, you know, contributing data and make it available uh, after you are done with the project, uh, they emphasize that a, a lot. But in the interim, uh, and uh, uh, also don't mention like the precision medicine, these kind of things. I mean, but in the interim, uh, like uh, the current situation is uh, a lot of the times, for example, your ad, uh, ethnic data, which you have a lot of detailed data about imaging genomics. Uh, on the other, on the other hand, like Jia, you, you know, we have this dialogue data, and uh, for example, we also have a large, you know, uh, clinical research network where large amount of electronic health record data is there. So we commonly see this kind of scenario, like the, we have different, uh, I would say disparate data sources where you have different patient cohort and with each cohort, you capture different type of information because for the specific purpose, you construct that cohort. So in this case, of course, I mean, individual level linkage is a, is a luxury. So, I mean, if you're lucky enough, you may be able to find some individual overlapping individuals you participating in multiple studies you have so that you have his or her uh, in multimodal information. But a lot of the times, I mean, the individuals, you wouldn't know who is who, especially in medicine. I mean, we, we, I mean, we, we work on de-identified data. So, uh, uh, Jay, what, what do you think? Or, I mean, like, what's your perspective on what we can do in the current scenario? Like, we have these really disparate data sources. We have different samples and different uh, features uh, from machine learning language. So is there any possibility that we can somehow, in, I mean, join the efforts like uh, uh, to jointly explore those disparate sources? Is there any, like, promising, like, uh, or even uh, like from re reinforcement learning perspective, I mean, we can leverage those disparate data sources to, to boost the algorithm performance. All right, thanks. So this is a, really a catch up question for me. And I mean, uh, yeah, we've been, we've been uh, thinking about this for a while. I mean, I still recall one of the scenario we were trying to, you know, uh, trying to asking for um, imaging data and say, hey, we have the imaging data uh, that I can give it to you. And they, okay, do you have more clinical information about that? And to say, if you need to connect to, uh, let's say the, um, the medical records, right? And it's gonna be 10% of data for you. Say 10%? Is it? Yes, because you know many of them they don't they don't come with that kind of collective information, right? So the, you know this is pretty common. Like uh, the more 
the more type of information that you, you want, including your analysis, the, the less samples that you have, right? So this is pretty, pretty common, I'll say pretty common stuff. And there are a couple of ways where we can uh, where we can do that. One of them is that if you there is possible, you know, there are possibilities for you to connect part of the data, part of the data. Let's say 10% of the data is connected, and then rest of 90% of the data uh, are, are not connected. And then if you want to if you want to use that kind of information, right? We don't want to waste the information, right? If we have one thousand patients, you know, from data from them, we don't just we don't want to use just the one hundred of them. We want to use the uh, the total, right? So the thing is that we can we can build different models, and then we're trying to connect them the the, the the different. We're trying to connect them different models through you know either doing the learning process or doing the data processing process. We can we can we can connect them, right? And say for example, uh, or we can. Um, this is a very intuitive example, right? So if we have, uh, you know, let's say 900 data points where we only have the imaging data, where we have another 100 patients where we have uh, uh, both the imaging and the clinical records, right? And then what we can do is we can we can build two models, right? And then, you know, we can require that uh, the, you know, the, the imaging part of them or share or some kind of joint training type of thing. So we can, you know, we can use, we can use as much information as possible in one learning setting. Uh, so that's something we can do. And then uh, the other thing I, I think it's pr pretty much for into your expertise is that uh, even though sometimes we cannot con directly connect to cohort, uh, the thing is that we can use some kind of distributional differences and we can you know, anchor some of our, uh, you know, most of our patients into one of those distributions and uh, trying to use uh, you know, what characterizes distribution as uh, either a feature vector or representation uh, to augment our learning process. So, um, so even though we, we cannot align the entire um, the entire data set uh, we have, but still we can use distributional um, you know distributional inf uh, information to bias our learning. Uh, so that's that's something we can do at least, right? So um, yeah, that's what I what I have. Yeah, but maybe you know some of the other audience can 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 jump in and <laughs> give some um, insights on this as well. Yeah, I, I just want to make a, that comments, but in generally think about this way: you have a different data type. And uh, imaging genetics, uh, even imaging, uh, you have different uh, sub um, the modalities. And all the genetics, on uh, the genomics, you have a different la label of data. Also, you have this uh, life uh, style data, and also you have EHR the data set, right? Now, these days, uh, we try to, to try to, to connect all these kinds of nodes together in a certain way. I, I, I do agree with that. You know, in these days, you know, there are uh, almost the few studies, you know, really. A uh, few studies really have all these data all simultaneously, or just for all the subjects, they have all these measurements. It's very hard to get that data set. To me, that the most important part is basically for each of these ages kind of relationship. If you, the data you have at least for build data ages is basically is, is unbiased. And, but in that case, I think the, that relationship we, we build is trustful, you know, is trustful, you know. And in that case, you can refine any just, you, you can construct one age at a time and try to, to build at least an initial um, kinds of information for that. And uh, even though they may not share the, the, the same um, data uh, number of subjects, that's one aspect. And another thing is, you know, that these days people are using larger graph. We basically, I, for Alzheimer's disease, at least we did recently, we built a larger graph for Alzheimer's disease. The reason is because yeah, there's a lot of different studies. We know that it's very biased, uh, you know, as many studies published. But at least we can, you know, connect all the dots together by uh, searching around, right? But at the end of the day, you think about it, and your, all these studies, all the information you have, you need to connect them and basically conform as kind of logic graph for the physicians or the, for the researchers. That's, I think that's my current solution for, I, I try to uh, try to do it. Yeah, I think uh, I, uh, Dr. Chu was talking about, uh, basically we fuse the information um, using a knowledge graph or using a graph and that's a data type, you know, data level fusion, right? So I mentioned about, uh, you know, another type is like, uh, you know, during the learning, the learning type of fusion, um, you know, both, I think both can be, um, you know, it's like a complementary to each other. So, um, yeah, Fei, how do you think? 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 great points. And actually, Jay, you know, I mean, uh, uh, my group, we are, we are building knowledge graph as well, I do think. That's, oh. uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, that's uh, right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, 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 so we have a pretty big knowledge graph. I mean, uh, but, but uh, I, I do think that's, a, that's definitely an important uh, direction. So yeah, I think we are on top of 75 minutes. I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, very impressive presentation and also really interesting discussions. Uh, uh, Hongzhou, so do, uh, I don't know, should I hand over to you or? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. I, I think uh, uh, we end this uh, seminar today. I thank all these participants and the speakers for, for, for wonderful talks and uh, thank you guys. Have a nice right. day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Take care. Bye. I guess.